So good morning. I'm delighted to be here. I see a lot of familiar faces in the in the uh, group, and that's always very nice. Um, I'm going to talk about experiences that we've had um, scaling up um, a couple of interventions. Um, Keep um, being one of them. Keep is designed to strengthen uh, the skills that foster parents have. Um, ultimately, the outcomes that we look for um, if KEEP is well implemented is that we will reduce child behavior and emotional problems and we will reduce uh, placement disruptions from foster care. During the first year of foster care placement, about 50% of kids disrupt from their foster homes. Um, and we've done um, a bit of preliminary research looking at what drives placement disruptions. And one of the biggest drivers of placement disruptions is child behavior problems. And if you think about, and in, in fact, after about six problems a day, your risk for placement disruption increases exponentially. And if you think about what happens in, in most foster homes, um, you get a good foster parent, you, put, you have a kid in there, you put another kid in there. Now that foster parent is dealing with double the amount of behavior problems per day because there's two kids there. And so, you know, there's a lot of things that happen in the system that sort of take, take successful parents and kind of blow them up. And so we want to figure out how to strengthen parent skills and how to preserve uh, the best <laughs> environments for the most neediest, the neediest kids in our society. I want to talk um, briefly about um, a, a, our most recent um, effort to scale up um, evidence-based interventions. And this, uh, this was a system-initiated um, child welfare reform um, initiated by the Bloomberg administration. Ron Richter uh, was the uh, commissioner of child welfare. What New York City wanted to do was that they wanted to change the way that caseworkers worked with parents of children in child welfare. And that included foster parents and biological parents. And so they came to us um, to help design that program and we linked um, two evidence-based interventions that have been developed at Oregon Social Learning Center. Um, parent management training um, directed by Marion Forgatch that's had a number of uh, randomized controls trials and is being widely implemented um, in, in several states in the U.S. and in Europe and KEEP. So we were focused on, focusing on working with both foster and biological parents and really changing the way, the role of the caseworker. Typically, how it worked um, and how it works in many child welfare systems is that caseworkers will um, refer parents out for parenting classes and then they monitor their progress. So what New York wanted to do was they wanted to change that basic relationship. They wanted that caseworker to become a support for both the foster parents and the biological parents. And so, that meant that instead of referring out for services, the caseworkers were going to deliver those, those evidence-based programs to families themselves. Major culture shift, major shift in the idea of what the role of the caseworker was. Um, so, and, and of course, being New York, the timeline was like that. It had to happen very quickly. So um, we worked closely together with the, um, with the developers it from KEEP and PMTO, and you know, we had come from the same basic roots. I mean, we were developed with the social learning theory. We had worked together in, in many ways for years, and so we had a, a theoretical model that underpinned both of these approaches. But even so, to present them as one thing took a lot of work, and it, it, it was actually kind of amazing because you would think that we'd be able to just go in there one day and get our language in line and get it, get it down and get it um, on the ground, but it, it was a little bit more than that because developers, you know, as, as we heard, these, these interventions evolve as they get implemented, and, um, you know, we hadn't worked together for quite some time, so it was important to kind of um, get together on what our expectations were because we couldn't say 
for KEEP, we want you to do this, and for PMTO, we want you to do that. So we did quite a bit of work um, together to do that, and that was, that was very interesting. Um, in addition, we added a, a third intervention that took the principles of PMTO and KEEP and worked with the caseworker supervisors to bring those principles into daily practice. So how can they use um, the, the, the core components of PMTO and KEEP, a lot of which we've heard about from Carolyn and, and, and David and Ron, you know, parent, strengthening parenting skills, using a lot of reinforcement, um, you know, noticing when things are going right, building on strengths, and basically we developed this little intervention that we call R3, reinforcing the parent's effort or the caseworker's effort, reinforcing the relationship that the parent has with the child or the caseworker, the supervisor has with the caseworker or the agency has with the supervisor, uh, and reinforcing the next small step that can be taken in the near term to promote the parents' success or the caseworkers' success with the parents. So the idea was that we wanted to, similar to what Ron was talking about with Triple P, we wanted this intervention to be sort of um, at all levels, the same kind of message being delivered. New York basically had four um, outcomes that they were going for. They wanted to decrease placement disruptions, they wanted to decrease the length of stay in care for kids. They wanted to um, increase um, the permanency um, for kids. They wanted um, them to be placed more often with, with relatives or, you know, in, in the near term, be ta um, removed from foster care. And they didn't want the kids to come back into the system. If they figured that if those four things could happen, the, this initiative would be cost neutral. So that was done, uh, and, and basically there was a targeted number. They needed to achieve 20% um, improvement in each of those four outcomes in order to have this initiative become cost neutral, and that was the goal from the outset. So that was a different sort of way of thinking about implementing than, than we had ever done before. Um, and it was very, um, it, was a, it was a new experience to do budgets to, to try to figure out how much per child per day it costs uh, to do interventions and to be looking at outcomes in terms of achieving those, those um, milestones. Okay, so in terms of what it takes to, um, to scale up, um, we've heard about a lot of these, um, these factors, but I think that the way that Aaron's, uh, Hurlbert, Bert, and Horwitz conceptualize it um, in uh, their 2011 paper is helpful. You have the inner context. That has to do with everything that it takes to get the program basically on the ground up and running, running well, and, uh, and eventually having the, the agencies being able to take that over on their own and the developers are, are out of the way. So there's gotta be a path to independence. And then, and so that, that's all the kind of stuff that we have control over, presumably, or we, we'd like to think we have control over those things. Um, conceivably, we might have control over those things. Let me put it that way. Then there's the outer context. And that has to do with things like, um, you know, for example, when we did a, a, a large randomized trial of two implementation strategies in um, California, it was right uh, in the 2008 recession. And so that was an outer context factor that, you know, we had no control over that. We knew we could not, you know, have, have anticipated how to deal with that. And basically, it had a profound effect on the budgets of all the mental health clinics and child welfare systems that we're implementing. Also, change in political um, 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 regimes has a profound effect at times on, on scaling up. And these are things that we have less control over and so are very much more challenging and difficult to think about. Um, so basically, I wanna just, I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna focus um, most of my comments today about um, how we've dealt with um, trying to improve fidelity of um, 
of programs once the initial training is done? How do you monitor and support uh, ongoing um, high quality implementation? And then um, how do you measure whether or not um, the implementation is going well? Is there a way to observe the progress of the implementation and measure implementation milestones and be able to understand whether you're moving ahead as expected or you're having difficulty? So in both of those cases, in terms of looking at fidelity and in terms of um, measuring implementation, we wanted to focus our efforts on observations of those things rather than self-reports of those things. Um, and, you know, it, it, technology is helping us quite a bit in terms of being able to um, look at fidelity over time. I first want to talk about um, our efforts to measure um, implementation progress. We first started thinking about this um, problem when we did a randomized trial fun funded by NIMH that tested um, the effectiveness of two different implementation strategies of multidimensional treatment foster care in, it started out to be 40 counties in California. So the counties were randomized to two different implementation strategies, which I won't go into. They were, it was a head-to-head -head trial. And we soon realized that, you know, we had an N of 20 in each group. I mean, basically, we had 20 doing implementation one way and 20 counties doing the implementation the other way. And so we needed, we, we very quickly, and, and Hendricks Brown was in on this, when we were in on the planning and deciding how we were going to uh, set up this implementation trial, we realized that we, we wanted to get a much more fine-grained idea about what implementation success was than just like, did they ever get to the point where they got the program off the ground? And so we started looking at, um, we started thinking about, you know, the three phases of implementation, the pre-implementation, the actual implementation itself, and then whether the program sustains over time. And we thought that <clears throat> a couple of things were important. The rate at which things happened was important. So if if programs spent a very, very long time in pre-implementation um, and, you know, and maybe they would never get off the ground, but we didn't really know how much is enough to spend in pre -imp because if you don't spend enough time planning, then, you know, you're off to the races and maybe you haven't done things thoroughly enough to, to call it a success. So we were interested in the rate of implementation and the thoroughness of implementation. And so we developed this measure called the Stages of Implementation Completion. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've got a little cold here going on. Um, and we, we originally started out with, I think, 12 stages, but when we did the psychometrics on the stages, basically we, we found that we could identify eight stages of implementation from the very first contact that we had with, in this case, an agency in a county to the point where they were, uh, they were competent in delivering the program. And one of the interesting things was that at each stage, there are different players who are, who are key at that stage. So, you know, um, instead of, and this makes it complicated because you can't, you know, you, you can, system leaders are very important in the beginning to get something going. But once you're down into the implementation stage, the role of the system leader kind of fades at that point, and the, and the people who are actually putting the program on the, on the ground become more important. The other thing that we wanted to have going on with this measure um, that David mentioned so, uh, so articulately is that we couldn't burden the sites anymore uh, because they had their hands full trying to implement this model. And so we wanted to be able to observe their implementation without any effort or very little effort from them. So basically, we wanted to set this measure up so that we could track the dates through which e they progress through each one of these stages um, by simple observable 
kind of activities. And I'll show you an example of, so in stage two, <clears throat> consideration of feasibility, we looked at things like the date of first contact for pre-implementation planning, the date of first in-person meeting held, the date that they finished their feasibility questionnaire and so on. Um, and we could, we had access to all that information as developers. So we on the developer side had access to all of that information. Um, the other thing about this was that basically we are kind of making up what these activities are in each one of these stages. I mean, that's like what the developer recommends you do. Is that what you really need to do? We don't really know that, you know? We have a lot of crazy ideas about what you need to do to get, you know, to get our programs up and running perfectly. And maybe some of those are totally valid and maybe some of those aren't really needed. So we can look um, with the SIC at three scores. We can look at the duration, how long it takes to move through each one of the stages of implementation. We can look at the proportion of activities that you complete within each stage. And then we can look at how far you get in the implementation, implementation or the stage score. So we have those three scores that we can look at at any site. Uh, in this case, we started off implementing MTFC. What we found in that study was that um, we could reliably distinguish poor from, from good performers. Um, and, and we're just starting to really look at this, at this data. Um, but basically, so far, we've shown that um, pre-implementation, so that was the first three stages, the engagement, consideration of feasibility, readiness planning, um, and, and actually, this is an error here. It, it's stage four, it should be implementation. Once you hire staff and start training them, you're, implement, you're spending real money, you're implementing. So pre-implementation is those first three stages. Whoops, now I did something wrong, here we go. I'm trying to do something too high tech here, moving back and forth. Um, Pre-implementation sick behavior predicted successful program startup. So whether they moved through, their, you know, it, it's some, some sites went through pre-implementation and had very high duration and very low proportion scores. They did not have successful programs. They just whipped through it. They didn't take it very seriously, they didn't complete a lot of the activities, and they didn't have successful startups. Um, Pre-implementation also predicted whether uh, after startup the, the programs could continue uh, over time. And uh, pre-implementation behavior also predicted the number of kids ultimately enrolled in uh, the sites. And this is a key uh, factor because if you don't have a full program, you don't have a financially um, you know, viable program and the program will discontinue. Um, Lisa Saldana, a co-investigator uh, co on the California trial, and I should mention that Hendricks Brown was a co-PI on that trial, and Larry Palinkas um, did qualitative uh, analyses of the network structure of the relationships uh, um, for system leaders on that trial. Um, Lisa Saldana <clears throat> has an R01 now funded to look to see whether the sick can be adapted to other child mental health treatments. Um, and interestingly, um, one, of, one, of the, one of the really um, sort of I, uh, interesting questions, uh, are there universal, you know, we, we, we laid out the activities that you need to implement MTFC, are there universal Act, uh, implementation activities at each one of the eight stages. Um, and so I think that her work is going to be important to see if this measure is generalizable to other, um, other sorts of um, evidence-based practices. Okay, now I want to talk a little bit about how technology is helping us to monitor, how, how's my time? I'm done. Okay, I'm just going to say technology is great in terms of helping us. We, we, can, we can do video uploads of groups, we can f rate fidelity, we can, we, can, um, we can give consultation using clips of the videos, and I think that in, in years to come we're going to find that, that um, more and more we're going to be able to use this mechanism to um, help us have uh, better 
implemented um, interventions. And I will stop it.